All right. I'm back again with Mark Upton, the coaching science manager from EIS, uh, former Aussie Rules Football. Uh, thanks again for joining me. Looking forward to it, Brian. Let's do it. All right. So uh, the big debate within the motor learning space, I guess, ecological dynamics versus more traditional theories, uh, information processing type theories. Um, how is it best to understand um, ecological dynamics um, and are these theories kind of an evolution or just kind of completely separate looking at things from a uh, you know 180 point of view and mm. kind of need to pick or choose which one you're going to believe in um, mm. because because the opposite viewpoint um, is so diametrically opposed that you can't put them together uh, I don't think it's that. I don't think they're as diametrically opposed as they're sometimes made out to be. But often when debates start to happen, you, you start to get that impression that they're, they're far apart. Um, I think there's actually more similarities and differences, and, and a lot of it does come down to some terminology. And so, you know, particularly when information processing theory, then, you know, I, Check me on this one, Brian. Whether that was sort of around the fifties and sixties, right. and then more into then schema theory sort of came along. I guess a bit after that, and actually the difference between schema theory and now ecological dynamics and constraints approaches actually aren't that different. I think from the practical level of there's still a lot of talk about what the importance of variability and right. and you know being tun tuning into the to cues or information. So the language can sometimes is different but there's I think still more similarities and differences and even in um, I was just reading today actually early on an article looking at information processing versus constraints now talking about uh, Fitz's three-stage model so cognitive associative autonomous and digging into that it's actually very similar to coordination control and skill which is very much more linked to an ecological dynamics but actually very similar in a lot of tenants so um, there, there's probably still more similarities at the practical application level than differences, which is sort of reassuring, I think, as a coach to say some of the stuff we've already talked about in these previous chats, you know, around variability, around the importance of, you know, um, realistic practices with the relevant cues or information still holds. All right. Um, well, that's good. Uh, yeah, I believe... Um Schmidt, I think, is one of the first, you know, obviously schema theory, but I think he, yeah. he also published several papers on, uh, I know it was the first paper that I read on variability of practice, um, yeah. you know, with, um, I think he or one of his students did one on darts and then also um, just like throwing bean bags into, um, mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, a trash can or something. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, but so in terms of, Ecological dynamics then, um, how yeah. can we, uh, what are the important things that we need to know about ecological mm. dynamics from, a, especially from yeah. a coaching standpoint? I mean, a little bit maybe from a theory yeah. standpoint, but especially from a coaching standpoint. Yeah. So, yeah. So, where is it different? I suppose, and and, and it's really combining uh, ecological psychology and and dynamical systems theory. So, you know, the the whole ecological psychology is is really looking at, and we've touched on it before, that that close fit between an organism and and their environment. So, it's a lot of some really gets into sort of some some of the Dar Darwin type stuff around evolution and adapting to a nation fitness and those types of things so it's saying we adapt you know to the environment right. we can't adapt to an environment we don't inhabit example for example so you know how are we going to play play a game or a match well if we're, we're never really exposed to that environment very often so that's sort of the ecological approach it's as much about the environment as it is about the organism or the person or the player and it's the same they're really closely coupled and and the best learning potentially happens when when that coupling is maintained and dynamical systems is a little bit different like it's it's actually in its purest form more about mathematics so it's actually the equations and functions about how systems change over time like their dynamics so I think for coaches it's not as relevant other than you know some high level stuff about we talk about um, non-linear change 
So the simple, as and as a lot of coaches know, if they've been around a while, like development and progression in an athlete is often this, it's up and down, whilst the, we like to think it's just a linear progression. Actually, there's ups and downs, it stagnates, then it takes off and accelerates, those types of things. So I think that's the key thing out of the dynamical systems part. Okay. Um, so back to, uh, you know, what we're talking about, uh, the environment and ecological psychology so are we talking about just from a you know very general very broad standpoint like it's hard for me to learn soccer skills if i'm playing basketball or Mm. is it even a lot more specific than that yeah actually that that almost brings us straight to a contradiction at times about in one breath we do say it's how you know realistic that environment is to the actual competition environment or the sport but we also know we can get transfer for example from basketball to soccer or vice versa so what is it that's common but what's likely to be common is the, again the information in the environment and the patterns and relationships between how attackers and defenders move or how an attacker and a defender interact in a one-on-one is actually likely to be quite similar like there's a lot of Uh, principles or laws of biological motion that does transfer across so yeah it's an interesting one that about you know there's there's sort of this specificity idea but there's also the idea that some things do transfer as well from other sports um and you okay so this is one of the big things right in ecological dynamics uh information and how we use information becomes kind of one of the keys um, mm. key components of the theories. Mm. Um, but then the opposite theory or the original theory was kind of information processing. Uh, so <laughs> how, how is information or how do we look at information differently if we're taking an ecological dynamics approach versus a more traditional mm. approach, uh, mm. an information processing approach? Yeah. It, or is I there no difference? It, well, the difference, and we do get quite theoretically technical here, is the true ecological psychology or pure approach would say there's no need for the processing because the information has everything you need to act on. You don't need to process it, retrieve something. You know, it's not impoverished. It is in it, it only gives us a partial clue. We then need to go away and match it to something else, the experience, and then pull up a program again and, and execute that. Actually, the information is really rich, and so that's the idea of it's actually direct perception. We can directly perceive this stuff. Doesn't need to be processed, and though through learning is coupling it then to action. So I learn to perceive a gap between two defenders and whether that, now we get into affordances, whether that affords passing a ball through, whether that's basketball or soccer, for example. Um, so, they're, so they're quite different. But I think the key thing for me and the difference between information and cues is information is a con- more a constant flow. So it's continuous, it's dynamic, whereas a cue tends to be very um, more static and um, serial in nature. So I see something, a cue, and then that, that's it, then I go off and process it. So it's, again, a very discrete stages. Information tends to always be flowing around us. A, a really good, neat example is if um, you stand up and stand on one leg, and you know, I hope most of us can balance okay just standing on one leg, but then close your eyes, right. and you'll find most people at least either a little bit or some even fall over completely are destabilised. So what, even just that simple thing is actually we're constantly taking information the way light's pro- projected off walls and the ceiling and the room we're in is being used to guide our posture or to constrain our posture in a way. So uh, this is coming in all the time. We ne- we're never even consciously aware of it and we learn that from, you know, from, the, from being a baby when we, we come out and start kicking and carrying on and exploring our movement capabilities. It happens early on in a very implicit way. Um, Going back a little bit to what you said, is it safe to say the cue, um, you know, as you were speaking about it, creates a kind of an um, if-then, you know, decision, whereas uh, if you're looking at information constantly coming in, it's harder to have that if then and it yeah almost would then become 
constant if then if then if then if then yeah <laughs> exactly that's exactly how i'd look at it as well is they be, it becomes so so rapid if you like or constant that it just blurs um and so i think a good a good example i was watching um Barcelona the other day and you know Messi beat his defender is basically one on one with the keeper sort of from 15 just inside the box and and as he was getting closer you know the keeper started to come he was getting closer you could see it was, is he going to go left or right and in the slow mo like they had from behind him you see he's taking his leg away and even from the time he's taking his kicking leg away to it coming through between his hip knee and ankle there's just subtle movements all the way through because it's coupled to what the keeper's doing, yeah. and at the very la- at the it gets so it's a constant flow, and then at the point of ball contact, it emerged basically that, that the decision was to go left. So you know his ankle right. moved in the appropriate way, but actually there was you know perception action loops happening, you know probably 10, 12, 15 times from the time he took his leg away to coming through, and that's where we're saying you're not just that's not just executing one action. It's a constant flow of perceiving and moving and acting. So from a coaching standpoint, if if I can use the old traditional theories and just give an if-then cue, right? Yeah. That becomes yeah, yeah. easier for me to teach. So if yeah. if the defensive player does this, then you do this. Um, yeah. That's, yeah. that's um, something that I can easily explain, easily demonstrate. Yeah. Um, how can I then from an ecological dynamic standpoint uh coach and you know develop like what you're speaking of with messi how Mm. in the world Mm. would you uh teach develop uh encourage um you know that type of behavior you know obviously obviously you know with a younger or less experienced player not to that uh you know degree of expertise Mm. but how Mm. would you begin you know developing that with a little messi Mm, yeah, so it is. Yeah, it, these that type of um, learning does tend to be more implicit. As in, it really is hard to to verbally <laughs> explain and learn from a verbal w- explanation of what's going on in that messy example. So you le- you learn it by being put in that in that situation. You know, lots and lots of times you become attuned to these things of what you're looking for and, you know, whether it was the movement of the goalkeeper's hips or knees or hands or whatever. And and it's really interesting. Some players can then still verbalise back what they're looking at, but a number, you know, can't much at all. They're vague or they can't really say other than, you know, I just knew I had, I you know, the opening was to the left. I don't know how I was able to figure that out, but I was. So it's definitely much more implicit, learned by doing. There are still occasions, though, and I think more at a strategic tactical level, it tends to work still sort of a couple of levels where sometimes um, you're still using a cue like it might be more to run a certain play. You know, so say the ball's out of bounds, you know, two seconds on the shot clock, that's a cue that we run this this play. So that, that sort of sets us going, but then within that, there'll still be some minor and then the defence will start to react and I'll react sure. off that. So then you're more reacting in real time, if you like, to the information. So I think they actually still coexist. Okay, great. All right, well, thank you again for joining us. No worries.